And it's time now for this afternoon's main event. And while the two people presenting it probably need no introduction in front of this crowd, I'm going to give them one anyway. The entertainment career of Mr. Pat Boone began all the way back in 1954. And in the 64 years since, he's made an indelible and distinctive mark on American popular culture. That mark includes 72 studio albums, 72, and six singles that hit number one in the United States, as well as live action or voiceover appearances in 26 feature films. In a 1957 poll of high school students, he was preferred over Elvis, the king, by a two to one margin among boys, and get this, a three to one margin among girls. Elvis Sue. <laughs> Elvis Sue, indeed, Morton, Elvis Morton. <laughs> Throughout all the ups and downs of show business stardom, though, Pat has remained firmly a family man. In 1958, he wrote a book for teenagers, I have a copy here, Twix 12 and 20, offering advice for staying on the straight and narrow. And maybe if we're lucky, Pat will sign it for us a little bit later. Now, Pat has remained faithful to his wife of 65 years, Shirley Boone, so much so, in fact, that when he was scripted to have his first on-screen kiss with Shirley Jones in the movie April Love, he asked his wife's permission first. <laughs> Together, Pat and Shirley have supported many, many programs here at Pepperdine, not the least of which is the Pat and Shirley Boone Center for the Family, which they endowed in 2006. Pat is also the chair of our university board and, of course, a generous supporter of Pepperdine libraries as well through the countless memorabilia items he has generally permitted us to put on display in our Boone Special Collections and Archives wing, some of which are on display right behind me. Now this collection is a fascinating slice of 20th century Americana that makes our Payson Library utterly unique among university libraries in this country. Thank you, Pat. Mm -hmm. We're delighted to present Pat in conversation with Pepperdine's president, Andrew Benton. President Benton has been part of the Pepperdine family well, since 1984, and he was named university president in 2000. During his tenure, by the way, the longest tenure term in Pepperdine's history, longest presidential pepper, uh, tenure term, he has overseen dramatic growth in our university's assets both here and abroad. He's led the campaign for Pepperdine to success in spite of the global economic downturn, and he has forged a partnership with the Anschutz Entertainment Group, better known as AEG, that will raise Pepperdine's public profile to levels it has never known before. Now, I appreciate any opportunity to lavish credit upon President Benton for those accomplishments, because I know he would never do it himself. He's a humble, thoughtful, and caring leader, one who is known as just Andy, or AKB to students here at Pepperdine and faculty and staff alike. Both of these gentlemen have meant the world to Pepperdine for many, many years, and we're truly privileged to have them on stage together this afternoon. So please give a warm welcome to Pat Boone and Andrew Benton. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Russet. I am delighted that each one of you have come to our campus today. Um, you're going to be hearing some very interesting words from an individual I consider to be an American icon. And um, I, I, I maintain my composure when I'm around him, but I am so in awe of his talent and what he's done with his life and with his family and on behalf of so many great causes that if I gush a little bit today, forgive me for that. It, uh, it comes pretty naturally. Um, Pat, thanks for sitting still for this. Um, we've talked about doing it for a while, and here yeah. we're getting it done. And I was just sharing with Pat a little while ago, I think the, hist the tradition of oral history is sort of lost. 
And there's nothing quite like hearing Pat Boone's voice telling some of these stories <laughs> and uh, getting sense for Pat Boone the man. And, and for those of you who have the privilege of knowing Pat Boone the man, not just the myth and the legend, yeah. <laughs> um, you know what a good person he is and what a privilege it is that he is, that he is our friend. So welcome. Well, thank you, Andy. I, uh, I'm just astounded that, that these, these people have come. There's many other things to be doing, and uh, all I can think of is maybe they're hoping that I might say something outrageous like Roseanne Barr, oh. and, uh, <laughs> and it'll hit the news tonight. And I was there. I was there. <laughs> and it could happen. But we're looking forward to that, Pat, actually. It, we're, it uh, could happen. You're, you're safe on this campus. Yeah, some Let people know say. my politics, and yeah. so it could happen. So this morning, and, and Pat knows that I'm an early riser. My alarm goes off at 5 a.m. every day, even and holidays. And you get up at 8, which is pretty good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I get up, I get my prayer time in, and then I boot up my iPad. And I'm going through the headlines uh, in my iPad, and, and guess what comes up? Pat Boone recalls near kiss with Shirley Jones in April. That was today. I know. Yeah, I heard about it. And he says, I just wanted to stay married. So I just want to give you exhibit A and uh, t talk about that with us for a little bit. I I've got so many questions here, but I want to lead with uh, this, major this is, controversy. This is the headline and the lead article of something that I did 60 years ago. What, yes, it did happen, and I heard about it. I was getting texts today. Hey, terrific. I heard all about it. I'd heard, uh, heard some of something about it, but I, and I said, what, what are they talking about? Well, I did an interview recently on my way to Israel for a tour I just hosted and a concert I just did uh, celebrating the 70th anniversary of the modern era of the nation of Israel. But uh, and this came out in the interview, as it often does, because there haven't been many movie, movie stars or actors who had some aversion to kissing their leading lady. And so, of course, it hit the news when it happened 60 years ago. All over the world, I, I had to keep answering because my second movie, not the first, Bernadine was the first, mm -hmm. but it was in the same year. One followed immediately on the other. And I, Bernadine, there was no love scene in it for me at all. Terry Moore was in it, but we were t supposedly teenagers, and, uh, and it's a musical and no kiss. No, it, it wasn't in the script. So now I immediately go into the next film, April Love, and there was no kiss written in the script, and so I had never gotten around to asking my wife, Shirley, this was happening so fast. Uh, the movies, the television, the records, because I was about 21 or something like that. And, uh, and suddenly, doing this scene in the film with Shirley Jones in Kentucky, the director, Henry Levin, leaned over and said, now when we get to the end of this musical number, lean in and just tentatively kiss Shirley Jones. I said, on the mouth? <laughs> he, he, he said, yes. I said, yeah, Henry, that wasn't in the script. No, but we want to see the leading man kiss the leading lady. I said, and I just took him aside and said, look, um, I know this sounds bizarre and strange and naive, but I haven't asked my own wife, Shirley, how she'd feel if I spent half a day kissing our friend Shirley Jones. And uh, I think I owe her at least a chance to you know, say okay, she's okay with it, or if she's not, I want to know now. <laughs> and, uh, and so he said, all right, we'll do it a little later in the film. So we didn't do it, but he told somebody who told somebody, and it was in the trade papers the next day. Hollywood Reporter, Variety, Pat Boone refuses to kiss leading lady. <laughs> Subtitle, for, re for religious reasons. It was not for religious reasons. I wanted to stay married. <laughs> And, uh, and so I went home, I talked to Shirley, my wife, and said this thing had come up, and she, she cut me off. She said, look, I, I'm ahead of you. I, I know if you're going to be making movies. I just signed a seven-year deal, at least one movie a year for 20th, and so there's bound to be some smooching going on sometime. So she said, uh, I just want you to promise me one thing. And I said, anything, what? You won't enjoy it. <laughs> I said, I promise I won't enjoy it. So I came back all puckered up the next day with her permission to kiss Shirley Jones. But instead, the, <laughs> the, 
head of the studio, Buddy Adler, came in, had me come in his office. This is head of 20th Century Fox, and this was front page, you know, trade paper news. What's this about you not wanting to kiss your leading lady? So I had to tell him this. He said, well, good, because I told him that after talking to the director, you are going to kiss the leading lady. <laughs> I said, Buddy, uh, Mr. Adler, I said, that, that sounds like overnight I just changed my religious scruples after talking to the director. Can I at least talk to the press again and get the story right? Well, he reluctantly relented. I did talk to the press, but it wasn't a story anymore. They, mm. It had already gone around the world. Movie actor won't kiss the leading lady. And the telegrams, the letters were pouring into the studio. Stick to your guns, boy. <laughs> There's finally somebody with morals in the movie business and others saying, look, you don't want to kiss her, call me, I'll come do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I didn't kiss Shirley Jones in the movie at all. Because it would have looked like, because of the publicity that went out about my supposed religious stance, that I had just dropped it like that overnight by talking yeah. to the director. So I didn't kiss her. I didn't kiss Christine Carrere in the next film. I thought it was still too soon. <laughs> and I'll never forget, this is a story I haven't told anybody, but she's a very voluptuous actress. They were trying to train it in France as the new Bridget Bardot. So it was very important that she do some love scenes in her films. Well, now she's in the film with me and I ain't kissing nobody <laughs> yet. So, I mean, that's before Anne Margaret, but we'll come back to that later. So, so Christine uh, asked me to come into her dressing room between shots and they were shooting something else. And um, I thought it odd that she had a, her dressing robe on and it kept sort of kind of falling open while we were talking. And she, it was almost like a scene from, uh, what was that movie, Lethal Attraction or one of those films? Sharon Stone, anyway, <laughs> and I, I, it's, it's, I'm not naive to that extent. I knew what was going on. She said, well, why won't you kiss me? I had to go through this dumb story again <laughs> and tell her why I'm not kissing a leading lady in a film yet. But you know, we are in love in the film. We're supposed to kiss. And I said, but we ain't going to kiss in this film. And, uh, and she didn't understand it. Eventually, of course, there were quite a few others that I did kiss. But Surely, the one scene that she did <laughs> have a little trouble with was State Fair with Anne Margaret. And there was a real good screen kiss in that film. And I didn't see it. I didn't realize it, it seemed as erotic as it came across on the film. I mean, to me, I was doing my job and uh, trying to keep the shadow of my nose off uh, Anne Margaret's face. <laughs> lip syncing the song, a Richard Rogers song that had been written for me, willing and eager for the film. And uh, so when that kiss happened, and I, I hadn't seen it on the screen, so we're in a film uh, pre premiere in London, and little Cherry, about six or seven years old, was in the seat between Shirley and me, and now sudden this kiss happens, and I'm thinking, oh boy, we're gonna have a little discussion about this tonight, I'm sure. And um, so, but Cherry leaned up and whispered something to Shirley. I didn't know what it was. Afterwards, at night, put Cherry to bed. I, Honey, what was that Cherry whispered to you? She said, you're a very lucky man. She mm -hmm. said, don't worry, Mommy, he's just acting. <laughs> just acting. And, and, and I said, I promise you, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't, I didn't enjoy it. And if you believe that, I have another couple stories. <laughs> well, I... Not to start with controversy, but I just thought we'd have a little fun with that. I, I, know that, I know that she would speak about it easily. Isn't it true that later you did kiss Shirley Jones? Yes. Oh, you did some homework. Just yeah. a little. Fifty years later. Yeah. It was at a, a recent, fairly recent showing of the film April Love. They redid the film. You know, it was sparkling and beautiful and looked like it's brand new. Down at the Cinematheque. Well, that was one thing, but there was another Cinematheque in Hollywood the first time. Marty Ingalls, her husband, was there, Shirley and I. And I said, you know, we've been kidding about the fact we owe each other a kiss. And it's been 50 years now at that point. And if it's okay with Marty, Shirley's already given me impression, uh, her permission. So we agreed when the film ended, we talked about that. And then with the cameras on, somebody somewhere has got the film of us kissing. Now, <laughs> when 
I don't know what was in Shirley Jones' mind at that point, but I said, okay, now I'm directing. And this is the end of the musical number, and we're two naive teenagers, and I'm gonna lean in and kiss you. And as I leaned toward her, she turned me her cheek. I said, oh, oh no, no, no. And I put her face back, no, it was, we're still teenagers, but it was a kiss. And so there was just a light little bus. I wouldn't even call it, it just, what's the old fashioned word? A slight bus, B-U-S-S. -S. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an outright <coughs> smooch, but I did kiss her. It's on film somewhere 50 years later. I won't tell you what Marty Ingalls said, <laughs> but it was just a joke. And, and my Shirley wasn't there for that, so I could still say I didn't enjoy it. I did kiss her, but I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> so take us back. You, you grew up singing in church, no doubt. Yes. And your brother, uh, Alt Nick, also had a really great voice. So I'm, I'm guessing there were some duets and... And people recognized your talent, but what was your break? What was your first opportunity to be in, in show business and a singer? The Bell Mead Happiness Club and in the Bell Mead, Cal uh, Tennessee, uh, a wealthy suburb of, uh, of Nashville. They had a, 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 just a movie theater, but it was, the manager was an old vaudevillian named Ed Jordan. And uh, he decided to put on a little talent show at the beginning before the movie, there was, in those days, on a Saturday afternoon, parents would bring all the little kids, turn them over to the theater for about three hours, because there would be cartoons, there would be newsreels, which the kids weren't interested in, and, um, and usually a serial. Mid used to have ongoing episodic serials, westerns, Perils of Pauline, things like that, and then a movie, some kind of a family, kid-friendly film, and then we had this little talent show three or four performers and to get on that show you had to go downtown Nashville and audition for a lady who ran a, a dance studio called the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bryant Combs dance studio so of course she was looking for dancers but if you could sing or play a piano or some other instrument or whatever you'd audition and she'd pick three performers and then we would all perform if I say we because I did it at least a half a dozen times and it was my first taste of actually getting in front of a live audience. Except the live audience was all little kids running up and down the aisles, pulling girls' hair, throwing popcorn all over each other, not listening to anything happening on the stage much. But Ed was up there trying to conduct this show, and whoever got the most applause of the three, there were a, a prize for each, an ice cream cone for number three, a, a, a sundae or a soda for number two, or banana split for the number one. Mm -hmm. Well, that was enough for me. I wanted that banana split. <laughs> so I, I would sing a pop song of the moment and had a lady named Elizabeth, Br no, uh, Ruth Mowry, who would play the piano for me, a piano teacher. And so she'd play it in whatever the song was in my key and I'd go out 12, 13 years old and sing for these rambunctious kids that weren't paying much attention. But for some reason, Two or three times I got the most applause, I got the banana split, and I was hooked. <laughs> I mean, from then on, I thought, man, if this singing can lead to banana splits. <laughs> and, and how old were you? About 12, 13. Yeah. When I, and when was your first hit single? I was 20, and it was Two Hearts, Two Kisses, mm -hmm. Make One Love. And um, it was a song, it had been a hit in the rhythm and blues field by the Charms. And what people who didn't live through the era, Wink does, because he did live through the era, <laughs> but um, uh, rhythm and blues was a separate genre from pop music. Pop music was Tin Pan Alley, professional songwriters, some amateurs writing songs uh, according to pop standards. Rhythm and blues was really earthy coming out of, uh, it was called black or race music then. And, uh, and they had their own stations, they had their own charts, they had their own artists. And they had big hits in the rhythm and blues genre, but they were not known to the big pop audience. But Randy Wood of Dot Records, who was outside Nashville, and he'd seen me on two talent shows that I had won nationally, and so he gave me a record contract and took me in a studio to record this song that was a hit in the R&B field by the Charms. One heart's not enough, baby. Two hearts will make you feel crazy. One kiss will make you feel so nice. Two kisses make uh, lift you to paradise. Two hearts, two kisses make one love. Well, 
it was Bad boon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a, a number one hit in R&B, but pop audiences knew nothing of it. So Randy Wood called me out at Denton, Texas, where I was in school, expecting our first child already at 20 or 21. No, I had to be 20. So he called me and said, I've got found a song, saw you on those talent shows, I go to Chicago, I recorded it till about three in the morning and listening to the, uh, the Charms record, trying to capture their feel. And, uh, and I got enough of it that the next day we found Frank Sinatra had just recorded it, Doris Day had just recorded it, the Lancers, the Castro sisters wow. all jumped on that one song and I was the only unknown in the bunch. But Randy sent me to 20 cities in 18 days to see every DJ, every rack jobber of the, who was filling up jukeboxes, and the, um, even buyers in department stores. Frank didn't do that. Uh, Doris Day didn't do that. And so I, Bill Randall in Cleveland, the nation's number one DJ, when I showed up in his station, he declared my record the version of the song, Two Hearts, Two Kisses, over Frank, Doris Day, and the others. And the, because he was number one in the country, the other DJs took his counsel and my record became the hit. Followed immediately that same year, 50, 55, by Ain't That a Shame, mm -hmm. Fats Domino's big hit. His had been number one and sold about 150,000 in the R&B field. I recorded it, it went to number one and sold a million and a half. And Fats was not unhappy about that at all because he wrote the song. <laughs> right. And he said later, I made more money from Pat Boone's record of my song than I did. Mm -hmm. And the same with uh, The Charms, probably, and Little Richard later, mm -hmm. uh, doing Tutti Frutti and Long Tall Sally. I've got a tape of his at home where he was on a black radio station soon after I had recorded his song, Tutti Frutti. And, and, uh, and the DJ asked him, how'd you feel when Pat Boone did your song? He said, I was still washing dishes in a bus station in Macon, Georgia. And I wasn't making no money. My record was on the air, but I wasn't getting no money from it. Mm -hmm. But he said, when I heard Pat Boone had done my song, I threw the towel down and walked out of there because I was going to make some money now. <laughs> and he did. And of course, Fats, Little Richard, and the others have all said eventually that my and Elvis and others recording their songs mm -hmm brought them into the whole bigger pop, mainly white audience that knew nothing about them until their songs were covered by pop artists. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it, it really was a synchronistic thing. We we're in a college campus, so I can use that word. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was good for them and good for me. We, were, we helped each other and we were friends and remained friends. And where do, where do Ted Mack and Arthur Godfrey come in to your right rise in, in popularity? That. Right in the middle of that because I won a talent contest in Nashville, which the first prize was a trip to New York and an audition with Ted Mack. I didn't think that, because I'd entered some contest in Nashville and I always came in second. I didn't expect to come in first because there was always in a talent contest to be a pianist, a violinist, a dancer, somebody that obviously spent a lot of time on lessons, learning how to do something terrific and I just walked out and sang a pop song, so I didn't deserve to win. But, but uh, I did win this one, and the trip was the prize, a trip to New York, audition with Ted Mack, the number one, of the American Idol of its day. Mm -hmm. The viewers selected the winner each week in cards and letters. If you won three times, you would come back eventually to compete with the other three-time winners whenever that might happen. It was pretty rare because they had all kinds of strange things. It, <laughs> It was almost like the gong show in a way because it wasn't just singers or dancers. There was a one-legged uh, dancer. There was a one-armed piano player, a one-man band. There was a, the, the guy, Connie Francis, no, Ann Margaret was on, uh, what's the name of the show? Uh, Ted Max Amateur Amateur. Hour, I was thinking American Idol. She didn't win, a guy beat her in the audience response playing an operatic tune on a leaf in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and he beat Ann Margaret, so she didn't get to come back. I mean, you never knew what was gonna happen <laughs> on that show. So I won it three times, 
I still live in Nashville, but surely that fall I married Shirley. We moved to Denton, and I thought it was over, that it was not going to happen. But then I was called back for the three-time winner showdown, and they told me I was winning that too in the card and letters, except while I was there waiting for the result. Arthur Godfrey was the biggest thing on TV at that time, and he had, in addition to his morning hour and a half on radio and TV, he had a Monday night talent scout show. So I was just in New York waiting in a cheap hotel to see if I was going to win or not. And there was a college scholarship involved in winning that Ted Mack show. But I could have used it. But uh, I went into the CBS, asked if I could audition for the uh, Arthur Godfrey show. And there was a woman, he said, well, he's not here and we don't have any musicians, but come in the studio. And went in the studio and she got behind the, in the, in the control booth and said, sing something. Well, I have no music, but I had sung on Ted Mack's show and other shows, I Believe, the uh, Frankie Lane song. I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows, a song of faith. Mm -hmm. So I just sang that in the studio by myself, and she said, nice, can you come back in three weeks? I said, no, ma'am. Uh, my wife and I are expecting a baby. I'm going to have to be, go home at the end of this week. I didn't tell her I was waiting to see if I had won another talent show. At least I had that much sense. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, she said, okay, we'll put you on tonight. Tonight? I had to go out and find somebody to be my talent scout. I didn't know anybody in New York, but our high school principal, Matt Craig, had a brother who was preaching out on Long Island. I got his wife to come on like we'd known each other for years. <laughs> And she introduced me, and I won that show that night. But all I got for it was appearing on his morning show, Arthur Godfrey's, for the next four mornings, and that was it. And I blew a scholarship. I was disqualified from the Ted Mack show because you can't win a professional show on Monday and an amateur show the following mm -hmm. <laughs> Saturday. They told me I was going to win, but I was disqualified. So, again, I thought, well, I blew it. I went back to Denton thinking that... Uh, I'm going to be a school teacher preacher, which, is, mm -hmm. which, which was my plan, because uh, it's the only thing I could confidently know I was going to be able to do and make a living. But that's when Randy Wood called me and said, I got a song, and I went to Chicago, and boom. From that March of 55, and this is a record <coughs> Wink knows that in the, we're talking about Wink Martindale, at least maybe the audience isn't seeing him, but anyway. He was DJ, and he may know that's a record I hold in the record business of 400, no, 220 consecutive weeks without ever being off the single chart in Billboard uh, from March of 55 to sometime in, what, 59, uh, four, four, well, 220 weeks, however many years that adds up to, mm -hmm. but it's over four years. Never was off the charts, and it was always with one record going down and the other going up. We never let a record drop off the chart till we were back on with the next. Elvis didn't do that because he went to the Army after three years. And uh, the Beatles, they began to put out albums, not singles, after three <laughs> years or so. And so the closest anybody's ever come to 220 weeks is uh, Elton John, 157 straight weeks. But I don't know if any, I mean, it can happen. But these days, <clears throat> tastes and even the singers and everybody cast of characters changes more rapidly. I, I was so fortunate to come along at a time. Rock and roll was just beginning. There was no, quote, rock and roll. That was a kind of euphemistic phrase in, uh, in, uh, in R&B music. But we started calling it rock and roll. Alan Freed, the DJ, everybody mm -hmm. starts calling it rock and roll. So I was a legitimate rock and roller. The guy was going to be a teacher preacher. We call you the unrock star. Up That's here right. In this. Yeah. In fact, there's many music critics that agree with that. Mm -hmm. In fact, at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I'm not in the Rock and Roll Hall mm -hmm. of Fame, though I had more rock hits in the charts, rock yeah, charts, than uh, other singers that are in there. But I made the cardinal mistake of singing gospel, country, pop, movie themes, patriotic, and uh, and to their mind that disqualified me. And you excelled in all of it, Pat. I was on the charts anyway. You, you said that was fortunate for you, it was fortunate for America, I think, when your <laughs> voice came along. Well, some will differ with you on that, too. So I, for a moment, I was going to reach out into the crowd and say, you know, name a favorite Pat Boone hit. But let me just throw out 
some April Love, Love Letters in the Sand, Almost Lost My Mind, uh, Moody River, yeah. some great ones. Do you have any backstories, you know, that lie behind the oh, lyrics? Oh, yeah. And, well, give us a couple of those. Oh, well, uh, well, Love Letters in the Sand was the B-side of another record. I, I, I used to, I think it was... Tutti Was it Tutti Fruity? Those, no. Uh, I don't need been, the backstory on Tutti well, Fruity, by the way. No, all right. <laughs> but, but it was the back, uh, other song, maybe from Bernadine. Maybe, I think it was Bernadine, which was my, because the two movies came back to back, and Johnny Mercer wrote that great theme song uh, for Bernadine, and it was a number one top, well, it wasn't number one, top ten hit. But once they got tired of the DJs of playing that, they said, what's on the other side? They turned it over, it was Love Letters in the Sand. And it sold four or five million, hmm. just because, uh, with Bernadine still riding along in the back of it, but they both got credit as, as mil million seller, multi-million selling singles. So uh, to think that my biggest record was actually the B-side of another record is peculiar. But then uh, April Love, I wasn't sure it would be a hit. It was a beautiful song, a couple of Academy Award writers. Paul Francis Webster, Sammy Fain had written this for me for the movie. And it was lovely, but I said, guys, it's rock and roll time. And this is just a real pretty ballad. It's, it just sort of lies there. I mean, can we do anything to make it more exciting? Or, they said, like what? I said, well, even an intro like pop, 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 you know, makes it sound like something important is about to happen. They said, we can do that, <laughs> and that's what they did. And, uh, and then Connie Francis borrowed that for Where the Boys Are. Mm -hmm. And then Speedy Gonzalez, well, that's quite a story, but Elton John borrowed part of that for his Crocodile Rock as well. But to me, the greatest story is Moody River because it was a Chase Webster country song. Randy Wood called me after we'd moved to California <clears throat> one afternoon. It wasn't unusual to say, I've got a song. When I, I've already booked the studio. I got somebody writing your arrangement. Come on down to United Recorders and we'll do it. This song called Moody River. Well, it was a country hit, but even then country music was not getting played on pop music. Now and then a Hank Williams song would get covered by Tony Bennett or somebody, you know, but it wasn't. You weren't hearing country on pop music. But this song to Randy Wood sounded like it could be a, a pop hit. And he said, I put it in a slightly higher key for you because I want you to sound strained or sor you know, sad. And sure enough, it was a little high for me, but I went down and sang Moody River about this girl that jumped in the river and drowned and left a note for her boyfriend that she'd been unfaithful to. Moody River more deadly than the venous knife. Venous knife, we know it, nobody ever knew what that meant. I don't think the writer knew. He thought it meant something else. The venous knife. Moody River, you took my baby's life. So I sang it for about two and a half hours. Randy Wood says, we got to smash, we got to smash. And, uh, and I went to pick Shirley up at our friend's house. And uh, Randy had taken what we called a hot dub, that is a disc made from the tape, uh, made to sound like the record, of course. It, by the, at that time, we were just still recording mono, as I remember, wasn't much to do to it. So he took this disc to KFWB, which was a big top 40 station. I was at our, my friend's house with Shirley. I remember standing in the door starting to say bye to go home to dinner, my arm around her waist. And, and I hear, ba-da, ba-da, ba-ba-da, 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 ba-da. The intro I'd been hearing all afternoon to Moody River. And I said, wait a minute, I turned up the volume just in time to hear the DJ at KFWB say, and now, for the first time anywhere, Pat, our new pick hit of the week, Pat Boone's Moody River. Mm -hmm. I wasn't home from the studio <laughs> from recording the thing, and it was number, it was a top 40, their pick of the week on the top 40 station, and, and, and just, just went right like to that. number one. Pat, I'm, how about the back story about isn't that a shame? Oh, <laughs> you gotta tell is it? it? Well, yeah, I was studying English. I was going to be an English teacher. And when they put me in the studio, my second record to do Ain't That a Shame, I kept saying, isn't that a shame? <laughs> and Randy said, no, it's ain't that a shame. Randy, that's not good English. <laughs> isn't that a shame? Uh, my, what is it? I can't even remember the next line. Ain't that a shame? 
My tears fell like rain. Good, good, Sandy. So, but he said, no, it's got to be ain't. And sure enough, it didn't sound right to me. So, okay, ain't that a shame is the way I recorded it. It went right to number one. And that was an epiphany, by the way, for me, because the first record, when I was doing 200, no, 20 cities in 18 days, that was backbreaking. I thought, I, I, if this is the way you make a living as a pop singer, I, I, I can't do this. I'm expecting our first baby. And uh, in fact, our first baby had been born. We were expecting our second baby already. <laughs> so we were busy. And, um, <laughs> and I'm in New York, and I'm, getting, I'm switching to, uh, transferring to Columbia University from North Texas, because with the record hitting, now the second record hitting, I'm going to have to be somewhere I can do TV, TV and, and records and, 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 you know, move from the East Coast. So I was riding in a taxi across town, a hot, I guess, hot August night. I think it was a hot August night. And uh, pull alongside a, cat, a car full of teenagers. And they had the radio up loud. And they were hearing, ain't that a shame? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to lean out the car window and say, that's me. That's me. <laughs> I didn't. But... Something melted inside of me, like, oh, this is what being a pop singer can be like. So it when did you all just hard work? When did you know that you'd made it? It's not like you to think that way, but was there a moment where it's that hot August night in the convertible next door? But when did you know that you'd made it? You know, Andy, that's a good question because it, it kind of sneaked up on me because even after three or four movies even after hit records, even after doing my own uh, Chevy show, mm -hmm. I think maybe while I was doing the Chevy show, because mm -hmm. it was a, a, a three-year contract. Your early had, 20s. Yeah, but, but I thought this is going to fizzle out. It's not going to last. I'd already along the way in my record promotions had bumped into two or three singers who'd had one or two hits and were working behind a bar somewhere mm -hmm. and still flogging that one hit that they had. <laughs> And I thought, I, that's not for me either. I'm going to be a teacher preacher. Even when I graduated from Columbia, magna cum laude, uh, and with honors, and uh, had taken my last exam, and I lay out in, the, in Central Park on my back in the grass looking up. Now, wait, I've got this TV contract, this movie contract, the recording contract. I was going to apply for a job, teaching job. But wait a minute, I guess I'm going to have to see where these contracts go first before I apply for a te job teaching English mm -hmm. at Pepperdine or Lipscomb. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, of course, by the time those, we finished those contracts, I, I knew that uh, I guess I was in this for the long haul, mm -hmm. at least as long as it was going to take me. Well, I want to talk about education for just a second. I, you, you attended Lipscomb University, mm -hmm. did well, um, went to New York City to... Oh, uh, Columbia. University. Columbia did well. North and Texas. North Texas State and Denton. So you've got all this academic attainment. You know, there's a presidential opening at Pepperdine <laughs> next year, and and uh, there's still room to get your hat, to, uh, your mortarboard in the yeah, in the ring. No, no, I know when I, there's a, an act too tough to follow. I wouldn't be trying to follow you if even if I hankered to take on that assignment. Uh, I, Actually, that I've been so uh, amazed that you can maintain such a a uh, calm exterior manner when I know the load of decisions that are on you all the time. Yes, on me too, but mine's just me. Yours is, yours is thousands and thousands of young people. I, I would just families. say prayer is good, Pat. Yeah, you know that as well, well as I do. we're both good prayers. So how did you, how did you come to Pepperdine? We're going to open this up to audience questions in just a moment, but how did you find your way to, to Pepperdine? Uh, through Bill Teague and playing basketball in Inglewood. No, I just, it wasn't that simple. No, I, A, I, I treasured my days at, at Lipscomb, our sister college. And, and I was still very active in the Church of Christ. In fact, I guess I was the best known n member worldwide. True. Shirley and I and the family. And, and so, of course, I, when we moved to California from New Jersey, and we were attending at that time the Manhattan Church of Christ, 48 East 80th Street, it was a brownstone building that had been converted into a Church of Christ. Eventually, it became a Messianic synagogue, but that's another whole story because <laughs> uh, it was a very Jewish neighborhood. But, uh, but when we moved to California, naturally, I was at Inglewood Church of Christ, which was 
the biggest church of Christ, I thought, in our radius. And I became a song leader at times and Sunday school teacher and still maintaining my career and doing TV and records. But Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, always there. And I, of course, members of that church were members or were connected to Pepperdine. So I, I was obviously drawn to a sister college to where I, where Shirley and I met back at Lipscomb and uh, was very much on board with everything that was happening. And I made the statement then, and I've made it countless times since, that having been in three different colleges, one a smaller Christian college, a big state school, North Texas State, and then of course the big American University, Columbia, mm -hmm. and graduate with honors from Columbia. But I, I felt and still do that the quality of education I was getting at Lipscomb was better than North Texas or Columbia. I made good grades because I, I, if I, no matter where I went to school, I was going to make good grades because I was going to work at it because I was going to be a teacher, I thought. Mm -hmm. And so Lipscomb, though, there was the, the atmosphere, the Christian atmosphere. Everything we were studying was taught and learned in a Christian atmosphere. There was nobody telling us there was no God and, and, and even making fun of us if we still believed in God mm -hmm. and, uh, and no nothing averse to wanting to pray before school or anything like that. It was, it was a great place to go to college and learn what I wanted to learn. North Texas was a big, more impersonal place. Columbia, nobody knew anybody at Columbia. I tried out for the football. I was going to try out for the football team. I just thought I'd still like to play college football. But, um, but a, a professional football player who'd gone to, won his stardom in college, I'm trying to think of his name right now, but uh, he said, Pat, forget it. Nobody gets a scholarship to Columbia. Everybody, only reason anybody plays football at Columbia is for their personal glory. And if you're out, you're already getting some glory from your team. Somebody, your own teammate's going to step on your throat. So <laughs> forget it. Forget football. So I did. That might have been very good advice, Pat. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Well, let me just say this. Um, you became a teacher. You did. And I, I feel like every one of our university board meetings that you chair, we are in your classroom. <laughs> and when, when you speak to us as you are today, you're, you're teaching and you're inspiring us. So you became a teacher. And oh, by the way, you had a great career otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I agree with you uh, to the extent that we all are teachers. Mm -hmm. Every one of us is teaching somebody else how to live. Yeah. How right. we live our lives is in fact is is affecting, if not infecting, other people. And Charles Barkley, I always wanted to, to refute him sometime. He said, I'm nobody's role model. Nobody's supposed to copy me in anything. But they do. You can't keep them from emulating you. Mm -hmm. Frank Sinatra said, I don't owe anybody anything but a good performance. But he's influencing tons of people. And I knew even in my limited, more limited sphere that I was influence a lot of kids. That's why I had to turn down the movie with Marilyn Monroe, which hasn't come up yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at those, my days at 20th, uh, Buddy Adler had this great idea of, of teaming me with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> and a film. Why not? Well, <laughs> well, that's what he thought, yeah. But, but it was a, a film, a William Inge script, great writer who had done Bus Stop with mm -hmm. Marilyn Monroe. Now, this was going to be a similar film, only her love in it was going to be a young kid just out of high school, and I was going to be that kid. They wanted me to be the kid. She just finished a hard road tour in small night spots. She's a nightclub performer, and now she's wanting to decide if she wants to go forward with that. She's come back to a small town to to decide and meets this kid who's infatuated with her and they have an affair. And then of course he wants to quit his school and get a job in a filling station and take care of her and she knows that's not going to work. And, uh, and so she leaves town and leaves him with a broken heart. And they made a lot of films like that and they call them coming of age films. Mm -hmm. That this is the way you come of age. And I, when I read the script I said to, I had to go in and meet with Buddy Adder, I can't do this film. What do you mean? It's Marilyn Monroe. You and Marilyn Monroe. It's got to be a smash. Yeah, but it's immoral, Mr. Adler. I said, I got a lot of teenage fans, and 
And then according to this script, the, the guy is bruised but not hurt. Nobody was hurt. He just had an affair and he'll get over it. And she goes her way and he goes his. And I can't, I can't do a movie like that for, with my fans. He said, that's medieval. He said, that's, I mean, what, this is the movie business. And so, yeah, and so, and so he said, he said, uh, all right, I can't, for, you know, if I could force you, I, if the, the, the music industry and the TV people, they would also join us if, if we have to suspend you because you won't do a movie that you're under contract. You don't have script approval. You, you should do whatever we order you to do. I said, look, you have to do what you have to do. I have to follow my conscience. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, they made the film with Joanne Woodward and Richard Beamer, mm -hmm. and it was a colossal bomb. I went into Journey to the Center of the Earth, which saved the studio, because they were about to go under bankruptcy, because uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton were in Rome sp some of the time. They were also going to Spain without anybody knowing where they were going. And they were making Cleopatra, and it was bankrupting the studio. But Journey to the Center of the Earth came out and took off like a rocket at the box office and convinced the bankers to, to ride along until they could get the Cleopatra film out. And I didn't know it at the time, of course, but a 20th century executive told me later, he said, your film, Journey to the Center of the Earth, which you did because he didn't say it, but I knew it was because I didn't do the other film. I did Journey instead, and it saved, it not only was good for my career, but it saved mm -hmm. the studio. If I'd done what he wanted me to do, we'd all gone down in flames. So, that's that story. Thanks. Why I didn't make a movie with Marilyn Monroe, I would love to have, but I wouldn't have enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a few questions in the audience. Please, Richard Barbera. Do you have a microphone? Yes, please. Uh, Pat, <laughs> I always like your tan. How do you maintain your health? I sleep outside a lot, That's a, <laughs> in the park. No, I don't. I, no, I just, I just love it, and I, I just paid a price today. I've got a bandage on this arm, took a growth off. I don't know why on my arm. I've also had to have a few zits off my face, but I, I just tell people I'm doing my makeup. Of course, George Hamilton used to do that, and he had to quit it. Uh, but I just love having a tan, and I, I feel better, and I love the sun, so. I'm willing to pay the price. We have Marilyn McCoo uh, together with Billy Davis in the house. Uh-oh, they know me. <laughs> Pat, you've told some beautiful stories that where we can see the Lord working in your life, yeah. like that wonderful journey to the uh, center of the earth mm -hmm. and how that movie saved yeah. the studio yeah. when they were ready to try to force you to do something that yeah. you didn't want to do. And I feel like that was truly an example of the Lord working in your life. Do you have some more of those uh, <laughs> examples to share? Well, yeah. I, uh, one I, that, that you would particularly appreciate, um, and I'll come back to Jamie Foxx, why he let me know how he appreciates it. But doing the TV show, the Pat Boone Chevy show, I was the youngest guy ever to have his own musical variety show. It just, for a 21, when I started, 21 year old, to have a, a network nighttime movie, I mean music and, and entertainment show was just unheard of. But, and I was having all these great artists come on and sing with me, and I mean Ella and Nat Cole and Sammy Davis and Johnny Mathis and, and uh, even some white artists as well. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just happened to mention these because uh, after my third year of doing this, and I didn't know this, but Chevrolet was beginning to really chafe the sponsor because they were getting a lot of noise in the South about the number of black performers I had on my show. I, it didn't enter my mind. These were huge stars, including Little Richard and Fats and others, and, and the people I loved and admired. And, and so I didn't know they were having this trouble. So Harry Belafonte called me one day. I didn't, hadn't met him yet. And he said, I've been watching your show for some time, and I like the way you treat your guests. And he said, would you like me to come on? And he was the biggest star in the world right then. And uh, I said, would I? Of course I would. He says, well, you know, have your people call my people, and we'll, we'll work it out. 
And so I, at the first meeting with the Chevy people, the ad agency, ABC Network, I said, you're not going to believe this. Harry Belafonte called me and wants to come on the show. And I get these stony looks. What, what's this about? I said, well, you didn't know we had to tell you eventually, but uh, the Chevy dealers in the South are having trouble. This was 57, 58 having trouble and uh, some of them saying they're going to switch over to Ford if Pat keeps having these black performers on his show and now Harry Belafonte is making civil rights statements and things like this and and uh, we got to tell him no. I was stunned so I just had to get quiet a minute. They went on to other business. I came back and said guys let me interrupt you a second. Um, I'm very grateful for having been able to do this show been a great blessing for me and my family but it's called the Pat Boone Chevy showroom and if I have to say no to Harry Belafonte it's not the Pat Boone show so I'm gonna have to ask you to get somebody to take it from here now I'm getting some real stony looks <laughs> <laughs> and they say you're gonna walk off your show for, because of that I said it's not because of that I'm from the south I know the problem I'm just not gonna be part of it well if if he does come on the show, can you guarantee there won't be any over, overt or, or subliminal kind of civil rights statements? Because I'd done something with Johnny Mathis once when we sang Let There Be Peace on Earth. And they, the choreographer staged it with me on the ladder and him just below me. But when the show happened, it was live, and I just forgot to go on that upper level. Mm -hmm. And I just stayed right there with Johnny, and we walked out of the studio at the end of the show with my arm over his shoulder. And, uh, and again, you know, this was, I, I wasn't doing it to stir any kind of controversy. I just, he was my friend. So, uh, so I, I said, I'm sure Harry Belafonte, if he comes on, he's a gentleman, I can explain the problem and we'll just sing some songs and that'll be statement enough. If he and I sing together, that's enough of a good statement. And, uh, I would like to say it happened, but it was at the end of my third season, and I made the decision then I would not go forward with the Pat Boone Chevy show. I would go to specials, which I did. And Harry, I, I don't think he ever knew why I never called him back till recently. Golf tournament with Sherry, his daughter, was there, and I asked her if he, if he ever knew why I didn't call him back, and he didn't. So he, she, Sherry got me on the phone with her mother, Harry's wife. And she didn't know about it either. So one of these days, anyway, the word got out somehow, and I never talked about it. But uh, I was at the health club fairly recently, and Jamie Foxx got out of this Escalade. He said, you Pat Boone? I said, yeah. He says, I got to hug you, brother. He hugged me, and he says, is this story true about you and Harry Belafonte? I said, yeah. And he said, you know, that might take some kind of courage now, but back in the late 50s, he said, I, and he hugged me again. So I wasn't doing it for any reason other than it just seemed right, you know. Uh, and, and I didn't talk about it ever. And now I can talk about it only because we're in a situation like this. And, and, and I do believe that uh, if you just try to take the right path, whether anybody will ever know about it or not, I will go one step further. Again, something nobody knows, but this is the right place maybe to say it. In the late... Six, no, the mid-60s, early 60s. I was popular all over the world. The records were hit everywhere, and I was being invited to come perform everywhere. So, the, of course, I got a promoter from South Africa, and, and we were sitting in the, uh, my office with my manager, Jack Spina, and, uh, and, and they're offering me a lot of money to come to South Africa and make perform do performances, because my records had been hits, and movies too. I said, wait a minute, do I, do I hear that you have this policy, I didn't know how to say apartheid then, uh, this policy that if, if people of some other color want to come see me, they, they can buy a ticket, they can't come? Yes, that's our policy. Well, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your country, but I'm just not comfortable yeah. <laughs> to do that. So I turned it down. My managers and agents said, you've passed up a lot of money. I said, well, I'll make it some other way. But they, then they came back, the promoter came back again. We had a second meeting, the same answer. More money, but same answer. And the third time, we closed the doors. He said, 
the promoter said, if you will give us your word as a gentleman, there will be no publicity, no statement made about this. The government will allow us to lift the apartheid for your performances. 1960 it was. And they did. And I, went, I had death threats in Port Elizabeth and in Durban. And, and I said this jokingly, but I, I was not much of a mover around the stage at that time. Elvis was, but not me. I stood at the mic and sang. But in South Africa, with death threats, I moved around the stage. <laughs> Well, I, I would just say, as we mentioned just a moment ago, you did become a teacher. Well, and that, that story is evidence of the fact that you did become a teacher. Let me take one more question. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you hear all right? Yeah. Uh, we may regret it, but yeah. No, no. No, you, you, we haven't mentioned one of his greatest achievements. Uh, and it's the irony of uh, it's 50 years ago, I heard these two, Fifth Dimension, yeah. standing ovation for singing Aquarius in Las Vegas. Yeah. But two weeks ago, I was in Israel, and this man had a standing ovation singing Exodus uh -huh. to a full audience in yeah. Israel. What a song, and what a yeah. tribute to the people of Israel. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And first, Ed, Ed knows I wrote those words, which is why I was asked to do it, mm -hmm. uh, to Ernest Gold's great melody. But Yad yeah, Vashem. Yad Vashem. Uh, oh, the, yeah, the, <laughs> this is interesting, because uh, it, it was in late 59, and the movie Exodus with Paul Newman has become a big smash. And the Ernest Gold melody, instrumental, but for Ronnie Teicher piano duo, no words. Well, I was aching to sing that melody, but there weren't any words. And apparently there weren't going to be any because my manager contacted the publisher of the song and said, no, there's not going to be any words. Professional songwriters have submitted lyrics, but they've all been turned down one way or another by either Ernest Gold, the composer, uh, Chapel Music, or uh, Otto Preminger, the director, producer of the film. Mm -hmm. So no, lyrics have been submitted, but one or the other of the three can veto any lyric and it looks like there won't be any. Well, I just couldn't take no for the answer for that song. And it was Christmas Eve, 59, and Shirley was begging me to help get the trees under the, I mean, the presents under the trees so uh, we could go to bed. I said, honey, one more time. I'd listened to it about 39 times, the Ferrani Teicher record, just wanting to get an idea to submit to a professional writer. I wasn't thinking of writing the words myself. But when I put the needle on, bum, 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 it's like I heard this land is mine. And I thought, that's the whole story of Exodus, those four words. Bum, 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 God gave this land to me. I mean, it was like I was taking dictation. I just, the words came. I wrote it down, just picked up something, started writing. And uh, in 20 minutes, I had written the whole lyric. Wow. To, Until I die, this land is mine. And I turned it over, and it was a Christmas card. And uh, two, two, three years ago, I was in Israel at Yad Vashem, and the big hulk of a man named Shia ben Yehuda came up to thank me. And he had tears in his eyes, this big man. He said, you don't know what those words you wrote mean to us here in Israel. Uh, we have a campaign underway to get all Jewish kids to know those words by heart. They may not sing the song, but we want them to be able to recite those words. When the morning sun reveals her hills and plains, I see a land where children can run free. Take my hand, walk this land with me. Though I'm but a man, when you are by my side, with the help of God, I know I can be strong to make this land our own. If I must fight, I'll fight to make this land our home. Until I die, this land is mine. And we, we want all of our kids to know those words. So for, as you say, became a teacher, uh, for a kid from Nashville to have been given those words to make, it became the second Jewish national anthem at this point. So I, I sang it there at Yad Vashem. They asked if I would give them whatever I wrote the words on. I must have written the words on something. I said, well, yes, and I would give it to you now. They want to put it on the wall of the righteous Gentile with Oscar Schindler and people like that. And he said, uh, 
I said, but I need to let you know I wrote the words on the back of a Christmas card. <laughs> and he said, so much the better. He said, so that the underscores better. the fact yeah. we know evangelical Christians uh, are our best friends and best support in the world. So I've seen it. Uh, Ed was with me just a couple of weeks ago, and we see it displayed along with Oscar Schindler, Corey Ten Boom, and others, my Christmas card, <laughs> written in ballpoint pen. Wow. Uh, on the back of a Christmas card, the, uh, the words to Exodus. And I will add, there's two little S and H green stamps in the, on the middle of that card. Mm -hmm. I put them on there because it was to denote that there's an instrumental in there, no words, and I, so I stuck these. And, and they're there still. And I told Shia Ben Yehuda, maybe it's appropriate because they are redemption stamps. Ah, well done. <laughs> God bless you, Pat Boone. Listen, uh, we're gonna, I've got one more question for you, then we're going to break. You're all going to have a chance to greet uh, our honored guest. Here's my final question. Your birthday is this Friday. How are you going to celebrate that? <laughs> Debbie asked me that last night. Have you made any plans? I said no, because Shirley's home not well. Right. We're trying to get her well and believing she's going to recover, but she's not able to go out, not able really I mean, I, I will be not totally surprised if, um, if Debbie and Lindy and some of the family surprise us. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but so far, I've made no plan whatsoever mm -hmm. because to me, every day is my birthday. Amen. I mean, I just, I revel in every day, even if they're full of problems, and some of them are, uh, but, and the one with Shirley right now is a major one. But I just, I don't feel the need at all. I'm, I'm just hoping that entertainment tonight doesn't know. <laughs> you It'll know, be our they'll, secret, Pat. They'll, they'll get entertainment tonight, they'll, say, they'll put three people's names on the screen of faces and say, guess whose birthday it is today? Yeah. And they've done it to me several times in the past, but I don't want it. Say, yes, today is Pat Boone's 84th birthday, <laughs> which means he has lived his 84th year. <laughs> He's beginning on his 85th year. But Ed and I play tennis all the time, and we're in great shape. So I've got lots to celebrate, but uh, I'm, I'm thankful to God, but I, I'm making no plans, and far as I know, there aren't any. Well, you're right. You've got lots to celebrate. Yeah. And I just want to say, God bless you, Pat Boone. Thanks for being with us today. <laughs> did, we, did we talk away the time for any questions? Or uh, I didn't know if Tammy, anybody. where are we schedule-wise? <laughs> One more? Going to be, I thought you said some from the audience. We've had a few from the audience. I've probably answered more than, than there are questions. Bill Davis. And he goes along with, with so many people, with so many things. And I just wanted you to share with them about that television show you did with uh, uh, Alice Cooper. Oh. When, you, <laughs> when, you, when you ended up on stage by yourself. Yeah. Dressed, it was the Grammy Awards. It was the Grammy Awards. American Music Awards. It was the American yeah, Music yeah. Awards. Yeah, okay. just, Awards. Just, just a little bit of it, Pat. Well, yeah, this was not something I would have brought up, <laughs> but, uh, but it is historic. Uh, and that was, I did an album of heavy metal classics with big bad <coughs> jazz arrangements. And the idea came because I was in England with my uh, own group of musicians and, and doing my hit records and people s are still paying to hear me do them. So I was there and uh, in between planes and one of my musicians said, hey, why don't we go in a studio and do some new things together? I said, guys, I've thought of it, but what can I do I haven't done 10 times already. Gospel, patriotic, folk, talked about country, rock and roll, and said, you never did any heavy metal. And we laughed about the absurdity of that. But as we talked and kidded about when we're gonna go in and make our heavy metal album, uh, Dave Siebel, who's my conductor, arranger for many years, said, you know, we've been laughing about it, but there's some good songs in heavy metal that we could do a different way and introduce them to a whole other audience. I said, good songs like what? I wasn't familiar with any heavy metal songs and I had no use for it. But uh, he, so he, he got, made me a cassette. I said, how would we do them any different anyway? 
Big band jazz. Oh, well, if we can do some big band jazz, I'm for it. So he got me a cassette. That's how long ago it was. And, uh, and, and, and I began to hear songs by all these rock and roll, these heavy metal groups, Guns N' Roses, Van Halen, uh, Deep Purple, and, and Motorhead, and Poison, and Scorpion. And, <laughs> and I was hearing some good songs underneath all the clamor and, and distortion and all that screaming, screeching, but some good songs. So we decided we would do big band jazz arrangements, and we started out as a custom project. But MCA heard about the fact I was doing an album of heavy metal songs, and they called me. Is this true? Yeah, with big band jazz. But it ought to be here, because all of your 1,500 other songs that we have uh, are here, and we, you ought to add that to the catalog. And they, they wanted to spend four times as much money as we were going to spend. So we did. We had two producers. We had uh, Michael Lloyd as a rock producer, and uh, um, Oh gosh, uh, the, the big band jazz uh, producer, and I've let his name slip for the moment, but uh, the, they worked together so beautifully, we called these big band arrangers together at Michael Lloyd's house, and I'd pick one song for each arranger. If, and I swear that some of the, I'm not gonna swear, but uh, <laughs> that a couple of guys wanted to have paper bags over their heads when they came to the meeting, because. They, they knew I was going to ask them to do an arrangement for me doing heavy metal, and they weren't sure they wanted to be part of that. But when I explained these are good songs, each of you is going to have one song to do. I want you to give me your best arrangement. They've already been big hits. If you'll give me a good big band arrangement, we may have another couple of hits from this album. And they looked around the room at uh, John Clayton and Tommy Oliver and uh, and, and uh, Jimmy Haskell and Ralph Carmichael and arranger after arranger. And if they're in this and gonna do arrangements, then I better do a good job. They may come up with the hit and I look like I sloughed it off. And so it, it was good psychology and everyone gave me great arrangers, arrangements. And the album, when I went on the American Music Award, Dick Clark had heard it a couple of days before. He was the producer. His idea was to have Alice Cooper and me give the award for hard rock heavy metal the king of shock rock and, and the guy that wouldn't kiss a leading lady coming on the, the same show. And so uh, we both agreed and we would swap images. And he was gonna wear a V-neck sweater, white buck shoes, carry That's a glass right. of milk, pull his long hair back under a golf cap. And, uh, and, and, and I was gonna wear an outfit that Dick had made for me by the guy that made Elvis's costumes. Uh, leather vest, no sleeves, not much chest either, tattoos up here, tattoos, choker, uh, shades, boots, leather pants, I mean, earrings, uh, the whole, I didn't have a nose ring, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, we were going to swap images and present the award for hard rock heavy metal. And the last 30 minutes before we were to be introduced, we were already at the Shrine Auditorium, and di uh, Alice had not, Alice Cooper hadn't seen me. <laughs> in my outfit, and he had not uh, changed either, and he said, I'm not gonna do it. I just can't go out there and white buck carrying a glass of milk, I'm sorry. Well, Dick had paid for me to have this costume, and I decided I was gonna go out anyway. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Cooper thought I was gonna come out in the tux, which I was wearing when he made his decision. So he went to get ready to introduce me as the future of heavy metal. And uh, if I came out in the tux, it would have made no sense whatsoever. But instead, Dick Clark had him bring the lights down, and I came looming out of the shadows onto the stage, stalking, you know, in my, in my uh, kind of a John Wayne kind of a walk, tattoos, shades, and Cooper's jaw dropped. He, he, didn't, he didn't know what to say or do, and the audience didn't either. There was clamor. It was just, there was terrific noise going on in the in the out there and I walked to the edge of the stage and just stood there flexing my pecs at the audience like, hey, you know, my, I couldn't have a mic, I didn't have a mic, so I could do his attitude like Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver. You got a problem with me? You want a piece of me? And I walked back to Cooper, his jaw is still hanging open. And I said, Cooper, you know I've just uh, done an album of heavy metal songs, it's coming out tomorrow, and your song is my, you are my role model. <laughs> 
and your song Noma Mr. Nice Guy is the subtitle of the album. And he looked like he'd never heard it, didn't know anything about it. And he, was, he said, does this mean this was the script that I have to sing Love Letters in the Sand? <laughs> <laughs> and I had prepped the sound man, if he asked that, to turn up any effect he had. And when he had, does this mean I have to sing Love Letters in the Sand? I leaned, that would be nice! <laughs> 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 and, 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 and he backed off. And, that thing hit the, and then we gave the award to Metallica. I had done their song, um, Enter Sandman, their right. biggest hit. Great song. And it was about a guy putting his little kid to bed at night. They, it sounds so ominous and terrible, yeah. but it, he actually, Hetfield, the lead singer, was singing, saying, now I lay me down to sleep, and the little kid sang, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And, and I asked who that was on his record. It was one of their roadies kids. They didn't have any kids. Mm. Mine was my grandson, T uh, Tyler, who was answering me on my record, but it was very much like their record. And when, that, when we gave the award, Cooper and I, to Hard Rock, for Hard Rock Heavy Metal, they came on stage and were bowing and said, Pat Boone's our new lead singer. <laughs> and I was kicked off Christian TV the next day. Oh. Because, I understand, they thought I'd gone over to the dark side. <laughs> They really did. They didn't get it that this was, I, it got all straightened out in about two months. We went down on TBN and I was on with, uh, there were 70 uh, Christian bikers parked their hogs and Indians and Harleys in the, out in front of TBN and, and were in the studio with their pigtails and tattoos and, and we explained, and I even played for the only time ever on TBN, Praise the Lord program. Um, a little bit of Enter Sandman and Smoke on the Water. Mm -hmm. I had done videos of Deep both purple. those. And they were both very harmless, good songs. But, but they, and I learned something from that because we're so quick to judge others by appearance. And I got judged as I had judged. Yeah. I judged Metallica and all these groups as, as corrupt people. I didn't want to have anything to do with mm -hmm. Cooper included. But, uh, but I judged them by their appearance, even the sound of their music, without knowing them. And when I delved into some of their music and wore some of their clothes, uh, I got judged. Yeah. Let's give Wink Martindale the final question right here. Pat, this is a two-part question. You had a brother. I got one answer. <laughs> <laughs> you had a brother named Nick. I do have, yeah. He's still living, I yeah, assume. Yeah. And I always wondered. I'll ask both of the questions, and you can answer each one of them. I always wondered, because of your enormous success and him also being a singer yeah. and making some records, at least a few for Dot, yeah, your right. label, yeah. if there was ever any jealousy on the part of Nick regarding your career. Question number one. Uh, question. Not, this is not a question. It's more of a, uh, um, right in the middle the late 1950s, when you were enjoying all these hits, Tutti Frutti and Ain't That a Shame and all those early mm -hmm. uh, pop versions of yeah. rhythm and blues hits, you recorded a song, and I guess it was selected by Randy, Randy Wood, and it was so unlike anything else you had recorded, but it reflected your background, of course, as a, mm -hmm. as a religious person, mm -hmm. and I refer to A Wonderful Time Up There. Oh, yeah which I think was a number one hit. It was, yeah. So I just wanted to ask you about that song, mm -hmm. and if people know that song as well as they do all the other hits that you do in your they show. They do, yeah. I, go back to Nick first. I, don't, I was not aware of any jealousy at all, ever, although we did, we did write each other out of our own wills. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, Nick... Nick was a, a loving younger brother, and, and he had not been as interested in, uh, in you know, being a, a professional singer as I was. I just got drawn into it. I liked it, and it happened. He decided, well, I can do this, and technically I felt, always felt he was a better singer than me. He sang more properly. I sang with feeling and not always uh, pure vocal approach depending on what the song was and what I thought it was expected. You don't sing rock and roll like an opera singer. And, uh, and so Nick did 
do some records for Dot. He didn't want to appear to be <laughs> trafficking on my name, though, so he changed his name to Nick Todd, which was Dot spelled backwards. He changed his name to Nick Todd, but the trouble was, no matter where he appeared, he was always introduced. Now let's welcome Pat Boone's brother, <laughs> Nick Todd. <laughs> and he, so he could never get away from it. And when he bumped into the hard work that it is to be an ongoing working singer, I mean, if you enjoy it, great. If it's work, it can really get to be too much. And he just decided he'd had enough of it. And he became a, a, a social worker and, and a Christian at Lipscomb, a, a teacher eventually, sociology, but working in church programs, uh, helping unwed mothers place their children or have their children and place them for adoption, elderly people and, uh, and all this uh, humanitarian work. Then he studied and became a, a sociologist and a teacher and professor. And, and I was able to create a Nick Boone uh, scholarship program as an endowment at, at Lipscomb in his name because as I've said many times about him my registered nurse uh, sister who who helped uh, C.C. Winans no uh, B.B. Winans wife give birth when they failed to have a successful birth a time or two but and then Judy just worked hard working for a, a good hard working man they were heroes to me in the way they lived their lives and um, so Nick and I, the only thing is we're one year apart. His birthday, same as mine, Friday. And, uh, and I didn't have time to think about what I'm going to give my brother, but I thanked him for being born on my birthday, so at least I had a 30% chance of remembering his. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I, 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 I called uh, Omaha Beef. And I sent a big package of steaks and stuff nice. to him for his birthday Friday. Um, but the other thing, a uh, wonderful time up there, yeah, Randy Wood knew that this song was a big all-night singing hit. I mean, all the gospel groups would sing and didn't know everybody's going to have religion and glory. Everybody's going to be singing that story. Everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there. Oh, glory, hallelujah. And... Uh, all the rock, I mean, all the Christian gospel groups know that and have sung it, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and I knew it too, but I knew it was an outright gospel song, and I was doing Tutti Frutti and Ain't That a Shame and, and all these other rock songs, and Randy Wood suddenly puts this song in front of me. I said, Randy, you sure you want to do this? And by the way, at that point, it was called Gospel Boogie. And that was my other reservation about doing it. I didn't think gospel and boogie belonged together. <laughs> it was called gospel boogie because it was boogie, eight bar, eight beats to the bar, uh, a song. And he said, well, it's got a great beat. I said, well, it's a great beat, but it's not a rock and roll beat. Well, it's got a good, good solid beat. Let's do it. Well, I got into it, and I loved it and sang it. And it went right to number one, and, uh, and I closed almost all my shows for the last 60 years with that song. I, I combine it with a little bit of Neil Diamond's Brother Love's Salvation Show. I sing some of that first and set the stage and then I'm, now I'm the preacher in his song with Wonderful Time Up There. Uh, the only time it ever caused me any <clears throat> surus, <laughs> any, any uh, any uh, heartache or problem was I went to a show in San Francisco. It was called a recycling show, and, and it was recyclers. And I thought, that's great. So I went, on, and George Burns was on the show. Uh, he was closing the show that night, and I was going to do some songs, and I was going to sing, and I was singing Wonderful Time Up There. But I found out that recyclers are garbage dealers. They are. <laughs> They're all, they're in the garbage business and they recycle stuff and they're all Jewish. And I'm singing Wonderful Time up there. I talk about, you know, get ready, to, the, the Lord's coming and better get ready and uh, everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there. And, and several of the garbage dealers came up and were kind of irate at me that I, and right while I'm singing it, they're telling me, get off. <laughs> We, we didn't come here to hear that. Fortunately, I had Exodus. 
So I sang Exodus at the end before, uh, before George Burns came out. <laughs> but that's the only time I ever had any negative reaction to it. Nicely done. So we're going to have a reception um, okay. now, and I want to th ask you to join me in thanking our good friend, Pat. <laughs> There's always more stories.